This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, an ink bottle, a, a child's raincoat, a sofa pillow, all are touched by murder. Here's an open-end wrench. It's a familiar object. If you own an automobile, you own one of these. At the very least, you've seen a mechanic use one. The steel shaft about eight inches long. The shaft bulging into a curve shaped like a horseshoe, which fits a bolt exactly. Simple tool. Almost beautiful in its slim efficiency. Well made, isn't it, Inspector? We're familiar with these things, Doctor. They're quite common as weapons. Yes, of course. One skull could be cracked rather efficaciously if this were brought down hard on it. And today, this open-end wrench can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs> Museum starring Orson Welles. Here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Yes, here lies death. Here in silent rows, is the ordered catalogue of the violence wreaked by man on fellow man. Here's an empty cardboard match cover. Perhaps you've tossed one into your own wastebasket this very moment, but not like this. That's hope. You know, from this one, the sulfur-headed matches were ripped to start a fire. A woman died in the burning building. Later, a man died at the end of a rope trapped by the printed advertisement on this match cover. Ah, yes, here we are. This is the open-end wrench. It's a common tool among mechanics, even among non-mechanical types, bookkeepers, clerks, teachers. No sign of violence or death upon it. Merely a bit of shaped, patterned steel produced for use in the manufacture and repair of modern machines. Look at it in ordinary circumstances, and it'll evoke no thought of tragedy in you or even in the motors to travel an English highway one quiet spring morning. Going at a normal speed, enjoying the fresh sunlight, the new clean green of fields and rising hills, the road curved ahead, white posts mark the edge of the embankment as the road heels slightly, turning to the left. Ah, quite a view. Ye gods, that's a nasty curve, if you're not awake. That fence, it smashed. Good heavens! There's a car down there! Ah! 
It's minutes only until he's back in his own car, speeding toward the nearest town, toward the nearest police station. There. Constable, there's a wreck on the curve about a mile south of here. You have anything to do with it, mister? What? No, 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 of course not. I noticed the broken fence and saw the car down the hill. Uh, I say, there, there seems to be a woman in it. Look, you'd better come. Uh, bring help. The doctor, who was also the local coroner, needed little time to determine which of his functions were called for at the wreck. She's been past help for hours. Must have gone off the road during the night. I've notified the superintendent about the accident, doctor. Yes, well, you fellows will want to trace the car. Any identification on the body? Nothing in the woman's purse, sir. There ought to be laundry or dry cleaner's marks. It's pretty hard to stay identified these days, Doctor. Yes, of course. You can tell the ambulance men to take her to the hospital. Hospital, sir? Or topsy. I can't just sign the certificate accidental death, you know, Constable. Yes, sir. Very well, sir. The ambulance drove off to the local hospital. Dr. Mason followed in his own car. At the wreck, the constable saluted a newcomer. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Johnson. Turn turtle, I see. Yes, sir. This is the man who discovered the wreck, sir. Mr. Frisbee, Superintendent Foster. Oh, how do you do, sir? Mr. Frisbee, yes. Yeah. You uh, left your name and address? Hmm? Uh, well, with the constable, sir. Yeah. Um, if I may, I have a business appointment. Yes, and... you go ahead. We'll send for you if we need you for the inquest. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, just let me know if you want me. I'll be available. Any time, sir. Anything extraordinary, Johnson? Nothing, sir, so far as we've seen. No fire? No, sir. I'll have a look at it. Very good, sir. Superintendent Foster poked around in the twisted metal. A point caught his attention. Johnson... Any idea which way she was travelling? Downgrade, sir. There are rather clear tire marks on the roadway, leading to the break in the fence, sir. Downgrade? Strange. The gear shift lever is in second position. Second gear, sir? Apparently. That grade isn't that steep. Just a point. Well, a woman driver, strange road at night. She wasn't in the driver's seat, sir. Oh? Tossed over as the car fell? Can't say, sir. I'd have expected, sir, that she'd have been pinned behind a steering wheel. Yeah. You may be right about that. Well, we'll leave things as they are. The insurance people usually want to see these wrecks. Hello, hello. What's this? Open-end wrench, sir. Probably from the... Yes, Constable? I was going to say the toolbox, sir. But the toolbox was locked. No other tools around. Oh. We'll bring it along to the station house. No sense leaving it out here to rust. And usual routine. Trace the registration of the car, locate the owner, or the next of kin, and check if it was the woman's car. The usual routine for another auto accident. Another careless or sleepy driver. The usual telegrams were sent, the usual telephone calls were made. The same afternoon, Constable Johnston reported to his superintendent. Yes, Johnson? Papers on the accident, sir. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I see. Owner, Martin Beach. Avon Mews, London. Has he been notified? Yes, sir. He's on his way down. The woman was his wife, sir. Yeah. Must have been a shock. Well, I took the call, sir. He kept saying he couldn't understand what she was doing all the way out here. Well, we'll deal gently with him. Dr. Mason reported yet? No, sir. Nothing on the autopsy as yet. Taking him a long time. Well, let's see. Get me Dr. Mason, please. At the hospital. Did you make certain on the tyre tracks, Johnson? We did, sir. They matched perfectly. The car was coming down, sir, on the side of the road away from the fence. It seems to have swerved suddenly, just above the curve, and made rather a beeline for the edge. Are you suggesting she went over purposely, Johnson? No, sir. It seemed like a point, sir. Most cars at least try to follow the road, sir. I notice you keep referring to the car and not to the woman. She wasn't in the driver's seat, sir, when we found her. Yeah. Stickler for detail, aren't you, Constable? Come in. Ah. Ah, you're both here. Good. I just put a call through to you, Doctor. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, he's just arrived. Well, what did you find, Doctor? You asked that as if you knew. Just a deduction. 
You don't usually take this long time on these jobs. I didn't expect to, until I found alcohol in her stomach. Oh, drunken driver. Well, I wouldn't know about that. In any case, she wasn't driving when the car went through that fence. Mm, Johnson's been suggesting that rather stubbornly. He couldn't be more right, Foster. Why not? The dead don't drive. Hello? Anything else? Quite a bit. In the first place, death was not caused by the accident. She was dead well before the car went over. You've told us that. You don't know how. Strangulation. Choked. Probably unconscious at the time. And what do you base that conclusion on? Four bruises, head and neck. I noticed those. I thought the accident... Well, the dead don't drive and they don't bruise, Constable. Those marks were made while she was still alive. I see. Definitely murder, Doctor. Definitely. I'd like to see the body. Come along, Constable. Your instinct may be... Three men enter the morgue at the small country hospital. Three grim faces betray no emotion as they view the woman's body. The doctor says... You'll notice the marks the strangler's thumbs made there. The obvious bruise is here, just below her hairline, on her forehead. The superintendent of police says... I see. Interesting, the shape of that bruise. Almost like a small horseshoe. Diffidently, the constable clears his throat, an inquiring glance from his superintendent. The young officer says... <coughs> we might try for actual size, sir. That kind of mark could have been made by that open-end wrench. And today, that open-end wrench is to be seen in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. We continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. The doctor placed the bulged end of the tool against the woman's forehead. The three men stood there silently a moment. The constable spoke. No question about it, is there, sir? Not as far as I can see. Johnson, when this beach fellow arrives, say nothing about any of this. And I shall want a trunk call placed immediately. I want to speak with Inspector Hall at Scotland Yard. The ponderous, inevitable juggernaut that is police work began to move, gained momentum. A fast car brought Inspector Hall and Sergeant Williams from the yard before train connections permitted the arrival of Martin Beach. The inspector listened intently as Superintendent Foster outlined the details. Then, quietly, no fuss, no newspaper headlines. Detectives were dispatched to run a check. Shortly thereafter, a grief-stricken husband arrived at the station house in the company of Dr. Mason. There's no question about my identification, Superintendent. Dr. Mason will bear me out. I knew her the moment that... That is... Doctor. Yes, it's Mrs. Beach. I can't understand it. I simply can't. She was a good driver, better than I. How did it happen that she was out alone? We lived a quiet life... Avon Mews is in a suburb of London, really. She'd often take the car for a drive. I'd go to sleep. I had to get up early. My business is in the city. She, she said she wanted some fresh air last night. I didn't miss her until I woke this morning. I can't understand it. Why should she be so far... A simple story. Quite commonplace, quite honest. One question seemed to puzzle the husband more than it disturbed him. Liquor? Whiskey, you mean? No, an occasional drink at a friend's place, that was all. Why? 
Are you suggesting Louise was a, a drunken driver? No, they were suggesting nothing, merely asking a routine question. Yes, they would release the body shortly. We, we have no relations, no one. We had only each other. I shall have to notify our friends. Yes, the police agreed sympathetically. And Superintendent Foster and Dr. Mason escorted him to his London train. Meanwhile, on the Middlebury Road. Your name, Carey? Yes, sir. My name's Williams, CID. My identification. Yes, Sergeant. Something gone wrong? You uh, heard of the accident down the hill? Yes, of course. How late do you keep this petrol station open? Twelve, one o'clock, depends on the traffic. And last night? I closed up about one. Locked the tanks and then mm. I... Any uh, customers around that time? Well, there was a dark sedan, man and woman. You got a good look at the woman? He was driving, bought five gallons. She was asleep in the front seat. Any sign of whiskey? Well, he had a breath on him, Sergeant. Seemed in a hurry, too. Edgy. Now, look, this uh, photo mean anything to you? Yes, it looks a little... It's hard to tell at night that the light's bad. Is she sleeping there in the picture? No. She's dead. They call it backtracking. They try to trace the car along the road it traveled. The gas stations first. In this case, where whiskey was present, the taverns and the inns were checked as well. You're the landlord here? Yes, sir. My wife said uh, you're the police. Yes. We're trying to trace a man and a woman. This picture mean anything to you? Uh, y yes, sir. She was here last night. Till closing time. Had a bit too much, I'm afraid, sir. No. Oh. Was she uh, alone? No, sir. No, with a shortish fella. Dark, quiet, in a nervous sort of way. I remember, because, uh, well, he, he wanted to buy a bottle, but I had none to spare. And I rather thought what was driving and all, they'd already had enough. That evening, Sergeant Williams gave the inspector his own report, and that of the men assigned to the railroad portion of the inquiry. They uh, routed the conductor out of his bed. He remembers the fellow all right. Bought his ticket on the train. Complete stranger... Shortish and dark. Yes, she was with a man, all right. Seems to me we'd better break the news to Beach. Hmm. It won't be pleasant. It wasn't pleasant. Martin Beach took it quietly, but with obvious shock. Louise? With another man? Inspector, you can't be serious. I'm afraid I am. Your wife's picture has been tentatively identified by a petrol station owner and by an innkeeper on the Middlebury Road. They'll be taken over to the hospital to check tomorrow. And she was with a man. No, it's not possible. No one could have been that secretive. And why? We just lived for each other. Oh, it's an old story to us, Mr. Beach. You're a busy man. Your wife was uh, alone a good deal. But when? How? Well, you told us yourself. She used the car alone and quite often at night. If I could get my hands on him... Oh, what fools we mortals be. We want him too, Mr. Beach. Now, will you help us? Of course, anything. Anything at all. Then uh, may we search your wife's effects? Of course, Inspector. Search the whole house if you think it will... They were quite thorough, of course. And very quickly they were successful. I found these in the uh, stocking box at the rear of the bureau drawer, Inspector. I see. Hmm. Letters. Mr. Beach... Do you know a, a Fred Hennessy? No. May I, may I see the letters? I, well, I, I think you'd rather not. And we'll be checking them for fingerprints, of course. They're all addressed to your wife. The last one makes the arrangements for a meeting place with the car. Is there, is there a return address, Inspector? There is. Good luck, Inspector. <laughs> The inspector and Sergeant Williams had luck. However, it was not exactly good luck. Fred Hennessy? No, there's no Hennessy living here. Well, now, perhaps he used another name. 
A shortish, dark fellow. With a flair for letter writing. No. Haven't had any shortish men staying here in months. Well, this is 346 Greenbull Street, isn't it? Well, there's nowhere else, Inspector. And what's more, I don't have any letter writers here. Every one of my men rumours, except one, works at the car factory. They're a tough crowd, Inspector, but they're nice enough to me. I take good care of them, I do. And the one who doesn't build automobiles? Oh, he's a constable, he is. Now, what would you want to see him for? A good question, and a big disappointment. Still the machinery ground on. The reports came in to the small bear office at the yard. Here we are. Fingerprint reports, Inspector. Now, the prints on the letters match those they found on the gear shift lever in the wrecked car. The ridge patterns conform to the smudges on the wrench too, sir. The conclusion is obvious. At the very least, it placed the maker of those fingerprints in contact with a murdered woman, in the murder car, with the murder weapon. It looks so as if he pulled off the road, did the job, then started the car downgrade, and jumped. Yes, probably. The unlocked door on the driver's side would indicate that. But what about those prints I told you to try and get? We have them, sir. Lifted them neatly. I was saving that for the last, sir. You see? They match. Yes, very good. Thought he was clever. Well, murder is usually an amateur's crime, isn't it, Sergeant? What about the men to identify him? They'll be in London in the morning, sir. To Sergeant Williams, the case seemed complete. The inspector was still somewhat cautious. It will stick, sir, in any court. I'll feel better if we have the motive, Sergeant. I like a complete case. Identifications have been upset before, and even fingerprints. Given a good motive, we'll hang the gentleman. In fact, we may be able to say he hung himself with his own cleverness. Inspector Hall here. Hmm? I see. Very good, Davis. No. No, just keep your eye on the place. Williams and I will be along directly. Get your hat, Sergeant. Very good, sir. Our quarry's gone calling on the lady. And so are we. The police car sped silently through the London streets, out to a pleasant suburb. It drew up to the curb near a small house, detached from its neighbours, surrounded by a hedge and trees. A man stepped out of the shadow, spoke softly to the inspector. He remained at the car as the inspector and the sergeant walked to the front door of the house and rang the bell. Yes? Miss Jeffrey? Miss Dorothy Jeffrey? That's right. My name is Hall, CID. My identification. May we come in? Why, uh, yes. Why not? Thank you. What can I do for you? Well, as a matter of fact, Miss Jeffrey, we stopped by to see your caller, a uh, uh, Mr. Marchant Beach, I believe. Inspector. Well, this is a pleasure to see you all the way out here. Is it, Mr. Beach? Of course. You know why we're here, don't you? I assume you saw me come by. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Don't you know, Miss Jeffrey? I know CID inspectors just don't drop in or come by. Martin, have you been up to something? You stay out of this, Dorothy. I'll not stay out of it. If we're to be married, I've a right to know. We've dropped by to tell Mr. Beach about his wife. Wife? You never mentioned a wife, Martin. You're not arresting me, Inspector. I was home and asleep when she was killed. The innkeeper says not Beach. So does the petrol station owner. So does the conductor of the train you took back to London from Middlebury. I said you're not taking me in. You're not. You're not. Inspector, there are French doors into the garden. Your house is well covered front and back, Miss Jeffrey. He won't get far. That's his warning. He'll stop running now. Oh, this, this is not the, the expected way to break an engagement to be married. Yes, I understand, Miss. But you'll get over it. This manner of ending a relationship is far less permanent than the one your fiancé used to gain his freedom from his wife? You know, miss, the chances are quite good that they've got away with it. If he hadn't written some fake love letters and forgotten to hide a certain open-end wrench. And today, the open-end wrench can be seen in its special place, in the Black Museum. <laughs> Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment.
here in person is Orson Welles. It's an old dodge, of course. May have worked many times. Commit a murder, wreck an automobile to cover its traces. It might have worked this time if Martin Beach had known that dead bodies do not bruise. If he'd been really clever and had succeeded in burning the car and the body. If, if, if. But he was not really clever. His cleverness failed him. Failed him at eight o'clock one morning in Dartmoor Prison. As for Dorothy Jaffrey, she disappeared when she had come into the great anonymity which is London. And so until next time, till we meet in this same place for another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Ara Marion, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. Museum starring Orson Welles is presented by arrangement with Metro Goldwyn Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Ara Marion with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. Mm -hmm.